a very warm welcome, uh, everybody. My name is uh, Nick Rose. I'm the Executive Director of SUSTAIN, the Australian Food Network, also a lecturer in food studies and food systems at William Anglis Institute uh, in Melbourne. And this is uh, a very exciting uh, moment for us. Uh, we are um, presenting to you today our action agenda for edible gardening uh, in Australia. If I can just get it going to full screen, here we go. So um, uh, a very warm welcome. Thank you very everyone very much for joining us for this uh, much anticipated event. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Wurundjeri and uh, Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I'm paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging that this is unceded uh, Aboriginal land and a very warm welcome and respect to any persons of First Nations ancestry who are joining us today. So we are very honoured and delighted to be presenting our action agenda for edible gardening in Australia based on the first and only National Pandemic Gardening Survey. This survey was conducted from 15th June to 15th July this year by SUSTAIN on behalf of the eight organisations that comprise the National Urban Agriculture Forum, uh, which is taking place on 23rd to 24th of April 2021 and the inaugural Urban Agriculture Month taking place for the whole of April 2021. The survey was motivated by media reports of the explosion of food growing at home, as well as shutdowns of community gardens during the lockdown phase of the pandemic. The survey received 9,140 responses nationally across every age demographic, and it was broadly representative of the diverse cultures of Australia. With the help of two wonderful PhD student volunteers, Anna and Pooja, and I think both of them are with us this morning, uh, and we owe you a very big debt of gratitude, Anna and Pooja, thank you very much. Uh, we analysed the enormous data set and delivered the findings to a national audience on the 16th of September. That webinar was attended by several local government representatives, and you can see here from these couple of quotes, their appreciation, as well as the significance of this research for their work. Also, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to the 30 members of SUSTAIN who are joining us today. Your support strengthens our voice and capacity to be a powerful advocate for food systems change in Australia. And we invite everyone today, if you get value out of this webinar, if you like and support what we do, to consider joining us and becoming a member of SUSTAIN. So after my brief introduction, in the first part of today's webinar, Kelly will analyse the multifunctional benefits of edible gardening and urban agriculture with a focus on human and ecological health. This will lay the foundation and justification for our action agenda, which I will present in the second half. We'll then have contributions from, them, from a number of uh, experienced practitioners working in this sector from Western Australia, South Australia and Victoria, followed by questions and general discussion. And as I mentioned previously, I would invite you throughout the webinar to share your thoughts, comments and perspectives with us using the chat function. So to recap, the purpose of this survey was essentially twofold. Uh, firstly, to take the pulse, so to speak, of the experience of Australians during these extraordinary months of the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions, with a particular focus on edible gardening activities and their significance. And secondly, to use the results to make the case for greater recognition of and support for activities that we already know are of great value and meaning for many, many thousands of us. We are making that case today with our action agenda and roadmap for transformation. This is based on an understanding of edible gardening and urban food production as a matter of public health that works at many levels of individual, community and ecological well-being. So this is our headline call to action a $500 million national edible gardening fund, which we see as a necessary and urgent investment in public and ecological health for the current and future generations of Australians. So the COVID-19 budget delivered on Tuesday this week was billed as the biggest and most consequential in our history. However, the Public Health Association of Australia has condemned it as bordering on the disastrous with no new investment in health promotion or prevention. Combined with the ending of the job seeker supplement and tax cuts that are skewed to upper income earners, many analysts believe that this budget will entrench and widen health, existing health and social inequalities across Australia. 
In response, we are calling for the establishment of a major national fund on the basis that the documented benefits of people growing their own food are very substantial, that they've been significantly validated by our survey findings, and that such a measure should be an urgent national priority. Put simply, the industrialised food and agriculture system is the biggest global driver of climate change, species loss, hunger and ill health. The case for transformation in the food system is overwhelming and this is what many organisations worldwide, ourselves included, are now calling for. We ignore the interconnected and reinforcing nature of all these drivers at our extreme peril. Many of them have been made more acute by the COVID-19 pandemic. Others will be further worsened by the impacts of intensifying climate change. Hence the policy implications for all tiers of governments, but particularly state and local governments are, we believe, very clear. Various areas of local government action bear directly on edible gardening and urban agriculture, as well as healthy food systems more broadly. What's required, we believe, is a clear commitment to make human and ecological health the top cross-cutting policy priorities. This must go together with a whole of government approach and a whole of system, uh, a whole of government and whole of system approach that is based on a deep understanding of the interconnected systemic and structural nature of the challenges and crises that we face. Action in this field requires leadership and a willingness to face fears and overcome a culture of risk aversion, which unfortunately is pervasive uh, throughout many areas in government, local, state and federal. The much greater risk, we argue, is that doing nothing or doing very little is completely inadequate to the scale of the crises we face, which are existential in their severity and nature. So as you can see there from the map of the country, this survey achieved excellent national geographic coverage. 62% of all postcodes in Australia and 29% of the country's total land mass are represented by the 9,140 respondents to this survey. Though the majority of respondents were, as you can see, concentrated in urban areas, there were nonetheless, was nonetheless a good representation from regional, rural and remote parts of Australia. Within the cities themselves, there was wide postcode representation. So before handing over to Kelly, Ariana will now share the link to the first of two Mentimeter polls. Uh, the question we have for you is this, what do you think are the top three obstacles to a major expansion of edible gardening and urban agriculture in Australia? So I'm now gonna hand over to Kelly uh, to take us through the, the health, community and ecological impacts of edible gardening. Um, before I do, uh, I should say that Kelly is the Chair of Sustain uh, she's a lecturer in food studies and gastronomy at William Anglis Institute in Melbourne, where she was the driving force behind the establishment of two Australia first degrees, the Bachelor of Food Studies and the Master of Food Systems and Gastronomy. Uh, so over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I'll just pull up my screen. Is everybody seeing that? Nation of Food Gardeners? <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Um, okay. So I, as Nick said, I'll be speaking about, um, I guess, the implications for health and well-being. So governments in Australia have a legal and moral obligation to optimize the health and well-being of the communities they were elected to serve. Healthy food and healthy and equitable food systems and sustainable food systems should be at the heart of any government strategy that takes these obligations seriously. The findings from our survey add significantly to the weight of evidence linking edible gardening with good health. As we know, Australia is facing health crises beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. The number of Australians living with obesity have more than doubled uh, in the past decade to 5.7 million. On current trends by 2030, 40% of Australian adults will be obese. The financial burden will have nearly doubled to more than 20 billion annually. These figures, that shocking as they are, are dwarfed by the annual cost of mental illness to Australia. Last, last October, the Productivity Commission estimated this to be $180 billion each year, or nearly $500 million every day. The impacts of the pandemic and economic recession will only increase this sum. 
At the same time, Australia spends just over 1% of our annual health budget or $2 billion a year on preventative health, putting us 16th out of 31 OECD countries. With those figures in mind, we'll now turn to the diverse ways in which survey respondents spoke about the overall relationship of edible gardening to their health and well-being. We start with the vital question of food security. As we mentioned in our last webinar, a surprising finding of the survey was that low-income households tend to grow the most food. This pie chart represents the most productive gardeners, those that are growing more than 30% of their food, cross-tabulated by income. 45% of the most productive gardeners have a household income of less than 50,000 a year. As people's household income goes up, the less likely they are to be growing significant quantities of their own food. This certainly challenges the assumption that home gardening in Australia is a hobby or leisure pursuit for those with the means to pursue it. The most productive gardeners tend to be the most experienced and also older gardeners. As we can see from these quotes, edible gardening is regarded, is regarded as important to food security, assisting older gardeners to balance their budget and eat better quality food. As this low-income gardener in Southern Highlands writes, very disheartened by drought and effects of bushfire smoke last summer, being a pensioner, the loss of home veggie crops impacted uh, uh, impacted heavily on my household budget, trying to get started again, but some of the joy of growing my own veggies has dimmed. A Kaura gardener near retirement explains that edible gardening is part of his strategy to extend his household's budget. A pensioner in Bailong Valley sees gardening as a way to eat better at lower cost. Edible gardening is important to food security for a number of reasons. Firstly, and most obviously, it reduces the food budget. Secondly, it provides a certain peace of mind to know that there's food in the garden, as this first gardener from the ATC indicates. Thirdly, it provides food with dignity, without the stigma that makes people avoid food relief agencies. Ballarat and other communities have created food as free initiatives to increase food access to anyone who needs it. We aren't saying that these initiatives will replace food relief agencies, but they are one way for communities to directly support each other. Fourth, gardeners know that their produce tastes better and is fresher. A food garden is also an important source of culinary, uh, culturally appropriate foods that are not available in supermarkets. A quick trip to the many community gardens run by Cultivating Community at Melbourne's public housing estates reveals an astonishing array of fruit and vegetables that are incredibly culturally meaningful to the gardeners who live there. Lastly, and as this gardener from remote central Queensland reminds us, many remote communities are hundreds of kilometres away from the nearest supermarket and rely on their gardens for fresh food. In remote Aboriginal communities, fresh food is often extortionately priced and of incredibly poor quality, which certainly doesn't make it appealing to eat. One gardener from outside Launceston who works in social housing feels food security and edible gardening should be taken much more seriously in her line of work. Edible gardens also have the capacity to make a significant difference in terms of dietary diversity. Statistics from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare reported in 2018 that only half of adults and 68% of children ate sufficient fruit. A meager 7% of adults and 5% of children eat the recommended serves of vegetables. The results of the survey show that, that gardeners tend to grow predominantly vegetables with a significant portion growing seven different categories of fruit or veg. Categories include things like fruiting veg, such as tomatoes and eggplants, leafy greens, herbs, tree fruits, or root crops. A productive gardener is therefore likely to be integrating many different types of vegetables into their diet, with leafy greens being by far the most popular and also the easiest to grow. The garden is also an, an enormous source of gastronomic pleasure. This gardener from the Gold Coast writes describing, uh, describes being so in love with the food from her garden. Her culinary repertoire has also expanded as the diversity of her garden grew during the pandemic. A low income gardener from Warren Dyte in Victoria is similarly effusive about cooking what she grows. Gardening encourages her to experiment with new recipes, to try her hand at growing mushrooms. She enjoys the deliciousness of her garden so much that growing her own food is now her new normal. These are, of course, only a sample of the many respondents who love eating from their garden. Perhaps the most effective way to encourage people to eat healthy food is to support them in growing it themselves. Gardeners do not need health promotion campaigns to encourage them to eat more fruit and veg. 
We know from the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation programs that children are more likely to eat fruit, foods that they've grown themselves, and it's no different with adults. Gardeners are passionate about their produce, and what's more, they love sharing it with others. These are compelling reasons to focus public health efforts around the pleasures of edible gardening around Australia. Healthy eating campaigns are far, far more likely to be successful if they're targeting activities that people actually already enjoy. As our Warren Dyke gardeners suggest, eating the bounty of the garden becomes second nature. Physical activity is another focus for public health messaging. We asked folks to tell us how long they typically spend in the garden per week. Only 9% spent less than an hour in the garden. About 15% were diehard gardeners spending more than 10 hours a week in the garden. Many felt that gardening contributes to maintaining an active lifestyle. For older gardeners in particular, it's important for positive aging. The, garden, the last gardener on this slide, a GP from the Central Coast, comments that garden has been, gardening has been the perfect physical activity to manage her health conditions, providing weight-bearing activities while also enjoying fresh air and sunshine. She also tells us, as a healthcare provider, I fully endorse edible growing as an intervention that would improve public and climate health. I would view any government support, federal, state, or local, as a very good and wise use of my taxes and rates. So we could not agree more, obviously. Gardening was very important to people during the pandemic, and this was regardless of age or income. Almost 20% of people felt that they could not have made it through the pandemic without their garden. An additional 62% stated that the garden meant a great deal to them during this time. Only 2% said that they could take or leave their garden. These figures are supported by people's extensive comments in relation to this question. Given the importance of edible gardening during the pandemic, the survey revealed a powerful link between edible gardening and mental health. A whopping 72% commented that gardening greatly or significantly improves their mental health, with only three saying that the garden made very little difference to them. Although we didn't include the figures here, edible gardening seems to be particularly important for the youngest demographic of 18 to 24, with 53% saying that it greatly improved their mental health. The benefits of gardening for mental health are well documented in the research, but we feel it's important to stress just how beneficial people felt ed edible gardening was uh, and share a few more of the comments and stories that gardeners took the time to tell us. An experienced gardener from Port Hedland describes the garden as a powerful antidepressant that keeps both his mind and body healthy. A low-income gardener from Hobart who struggled with chronic illness notes that the garden is cheaper than counseling and you get vegetables. We know that physical activity can be good for mental health with the added benefit of uh, encouraging a healthy diet. Gardening works at a number of levels to support health, all again, which are deeply pleasurable. Conversely, a low-income gardener in Brisbane describes the heartbreaking experience of losing his garden. As he explains elsewhere in the survey, I'm trained in horticulture, conservation, and indigenous land management with years of experience. Always underemployed, now unemployable. In poverty, home gardens and revegetation have been my consolation. However, when he was evicted from his tenancy in December, he was utterly devastated and shares in the survey what it means to live without his garden. My garden was an extension of myself. I felt amputated and traumatized without it. It was my primary means of contribution to community, interconnection, my therapy, regenerative permaculture, my activism against the consumption machine destroying the earth. I fell into a depression without it and felt suicidal. We'll return later to the particular barriers that edible gardeners face in accessing land, but this gardener communicates very powerfully how his very sense of self was deeply entangled with the plants, the chooks, and even the seeds from his garden, which he's kept. As researchers, we feel very honored that, that gardeners shared these personal experiences with us, and this one in particular, which perhaps also offers insights into the experience of dispossession. We were interested to see how the benefits of gardening on mental health had a kind of dual effect, minimizing uh, negative feelings on the one hand and stimulating positive emotions on the other. Gardening plays an important role in managing health conditions as these two respondents suggest. On the other hand, gardening can provide a sense of purpose as this Gosford uh, gardener notes. A Port Wollonga gardener feels that waiting for seeds to germinate is an affirmation of hope even during dark times. Another in Tweed's Heads describes the garden as a healing and happy place. In the last webinar, we saw gardeners describe how edible gardening helped them cope with PTSD. 
Here, respondents share how gardening nurtured them during the profound emotional distress that comes with bereavement. A low income gardener in Mount Gambier writes, I lost my husband last year and within the month, my father also passed away. My garden saved me from drowning in grief. The month of lockdown was the most peaceful and healing time. I played in my garden from early morning till twilight. The soil was still warm, the sun shone and the birds played around me. It was heaven on earth. Another experienced gardener in the Dananongs reports how edible gardening was a way of coping with her husband's cancer diagnosis and then his passing. As she writes, I let the garden go for a few seasons, but then got back into it when my health was better. Without a doubt, the garden and growing my own food saved my life. The physical fitness and mental health healing helped me to rebuild my life like nothing else could. We see from these stories that the garden has the potential to mitigate life's most acute stressors and disruptions far beyond the effects of the pandemic. At the same time as the earlier story of the Brisbane gardener suggests, the loss of a garden can be experienced as a severing of deeply felt relations and connections. And this is because the garden is a place of extraordinary attachments. Gardening is a solitary activity for 64% of people. And yet somewhat ironically, a recurring theme was how people appreciated the connections that garden creates for them. Those who did garden with others mainly did so with close family and friends. However, many gardeners spoke about the connections that gardening creates beyond the immediate space of the garden. This gardener in Beaumara says that gardening gives her a sense of agency and fulfillment while connecting her with other gardeners online. She describes sharing as the root of all life. Another gardener in Bankstown, New South Wales, who lives alone, finds the garden creates opportunities to chat with neighbors. Lastly, this gardener in Townsville describes her community garden as a haven during the pandemic. She could go there on her own, escape the stress around her, but also share food with others. Many people put excess produce in front of their homes, swapping produce or seeds, gardening tips in person or in online forums, or just casual chit chats were only some of the ways in which people connected beyond the garden. This desire to share and connect was a recurrent theme in the survey. Front yard gardeners were very enthusiastic about the front yard as a way of connecting with neighbors. Front yard gardening was described as a fa fantastic means of COVID safe dis distancing or socializing whilst building connections at the neighborhood level. This female gardener in Geraldton WA comments that her neighbors have enjoyed seeing the front garden develop. Passersby ask for the occasional chili or lemon. Another Adelaide gardener on a low income wants to expand her front garden so that she can connect with the neighborhood and as she puts it, be generous sharing what is grown. Likewise, a, garden in a gardener in Shepherd in Victoria wants to produce even more food in her front yard to share with those in need. She describes how her front yard promoted conversations and seed swapping with neighbors. Front yard gardening was the, has the added benefit of making urban food production more visible in cities and towns, which brings us to the next section. We believe that making our towns and cities more edible is not only good for people for all the reasons previously explained, but that edible gardening also has the potential to produce greener cities that are more biodiverse and resilient. Edible gardening is about nurturing lives, not only humans, but the myriad life forms upon whom we depend and which also make themselves at home in cities and towns. However, there are many barriers to creating these greener and more lively spaces on both public and private land. Our action agenda will ex um, expand, will ex propose how we can expand people's access to edible growing spaces. Most people in their, are growing food in their backyard, uh, but, but a lot of people are growing in multiple places. This, uh, the vast majority of people were growing in their backyard or front garden, but there was a huge diversity of spaces in which people grew food. However, the spaces in which people grow food can also make a, di a big difference in the extent to which they generate social connections. The call for greater access to space for growing food was a recurrent theme throughout the survey. Renters had real frustrations with landlords. Tenancy laws concerned this young gardener in Sydney's inner west writing changes are needed to body corporate laws to enable food gardening. So many people live in big units where there is plenty of space, but nothing but lawn and concrete. The body corporate should have to prove why it would be unreasonable in specific cases. Changes are also needed to residential tenancy laws, again, to include the presumption that landlords should permit tenants to grow food on the property. So many, uh, so many tenants are told they can't dig up the lawn or make any changes to the garden. 
Many respondents were frustrated by long waiting lists for nearby community gardens. Another gardener in Brighton says that council should resource more community gardens and integrate food production into old new developments. As she notes, the explosion of developments that leave perme minimal permeable spaces, surfaces, let alone spaces for garden, gardens, edible or otherwise, is appalling. This has increased stormwater flows. Schemes for promoting rain gardens, roof gardens, water tanks and retaining gardening spaces can enhance the entire neighborhood, as well as contributing to food security and the me mental well-being of the inhabitants. The upshot here is that private interests, such as landlords and body corporates, should have a role to play in increasing access to spaces for edible gardening, as do councils, which many felt were obstructive rather than supportive. Research, research shows that signif the significant potential of edible gardens to contribute to biodiverse urban environments. A 2010 study described home gardens as, quote, neglected hotspots of agrobiodiversity and cultural diversity. Food gardens were characterized by their multifunctionality, which provided nutritional benefits as well as acted as important social and cultural spaces where knowledge related to agricultural practices is transmitted. Many gardeners said that health and diversity of their garden was uh, connected to their own well-being. Respondents reflected on everything from habitat for food, uh, habitat in food for flora and fauna, to maintaining seed diversity, to fostering the microbial diversity of the soil. A central coast, a central coast gardener describes the presence of birds, lizards, native bees, and other small creatures as a gift that brought her great peace after the anxiety of her husband's heart attack. A garden in the Sydney, uh, the west of Sydney, describes uh, her garden as a source of produce for herself, but also habitat and food for all manner of creatures. Other gardeners talked about keeping heirloom varieties in their garden, but also swapping seeds with neighbors, which in turn helps to preserve the genetic diversity of seed stock. Many composted their food waste to boost soil microbiology. A few gardeners commented that they felt that microbial diversity in their soil contributed to strengthening their immune system seeing a strong connection between their own microbiome and that of the soil. A 2017 study in Frontiers in Microbiology suggests that this idea is not without scientific merit. The authors recommend paying greater attention to the relationship between soil biodiversity, gut microbiota, and the quality of human health as our living environments become more heavily urbanized. From this existing research and comments from gardeners, we gain insights into how the biodiversity and resilience of urban ecosystems is tied to human health in ways that are underappreciated in the planning and design of cities and towns. For many people, this has been a time of hardship and suffering, of loss and grief, of fear and anxiety. The garden has for many been essential to discovering and rediscovering what connects us and what we share not just with our, our fellow humans, but with all forms of life on earth. Gardner's story spoke about how growing their own food engaged the totality of their humanity, what they eat, how they respond to and feel about the world around them, whom they interact with and how they experience these interactions. In some cases, their very sense of self. We are also facing very real challenges with a rapidly unfolding climate emergency and dysfunctional food system. We don't propose that edible gardening is a silver bullet, but we do strongly believe that it has the potential to strengthen the ecological health of our cities and towns. The age-old practice of growing our own food, of observing, of drinking in the miracle of life, draws attention to the interconnectedness of our world. As this Sunshine Coast gardener expresses beautifully, the connection with the earth is a reminder that caring for the soil and caring for the self are one and the same. When the life around us is healthy, our own well-being, physical and mental, feels more easily within our grasp. This gardener from outer Melbourne describes how the presence of birds and bees provided a critical sense of security during a time of great anxiety. The effects of climate change on mental health cannot be underestimated, in particular, the sense of existential dread, a generalized anxiety, and a loss of hope for the future that it produces. As one gardener writes, from public health, political and systemic failures, to environment, to the state of our soil, the future scares me. The sense of anxiety about the future was expressed by many, particularly in light of what many describe as a lack of political leadership and meaningful action at multiple levels of government. A 2018 study of communities in Northern Canada and the Wheat Belt of Australia, both areas where the effects of climate change are being profoundly felt, describes an ecological grief, which the authors define as, quote, 
an emotional experience brought on by the actual or anticipated loss of, of cherished natural spaces, ecosystems, species, etc., caused by environmental change. We cannot afford to ignore these affective dimensions of climate change. On a more, um, on a more uplifting note, an experienced uh, female Melbourne, Bel Bel sorry, Melbourneian gardener believes that the responsibility that comes with nurturing life in the garden offers important lessons for how we might live better on this planet. She writes, this pandemic has highlighted how connected we all are and our responsibility to live more gently on the earth. Working in a garden is really the first step in becoming more open to the fragility of our planet and the importance of making choices that do not damage it. Our priorities need to be seriously re-examined. Connecting to nature through the nurturing of a garden will awaken us to what needs to be addressed right now. Allotment gardens were suggested by quite a few gardeners. These have been a mainstay of many European towns and cities for centuries, with estimates that there are up to 3 million across Europe. By way of example, this photo was taken outside my apartment in Munich, where I lived last year. In Germany, these are commonplace, serving a number of important functions. Available for rent for a small fee, food growing is not only encouraged, but in some places, mandatory for allotment holders. They were an important source of food security between and during the wars. Today, they connect communities by acting as social spaces for gathering. They are highly valued by municipal governments and residents alike as green spaces that invite bees, birds, and other creatures. They also provide spaces for composting and food waste, which can then be used for edible gardening. At the same time, they counteract the effects of the urban heat island effect and drastically reduce stormwater runoff and flooding. These gardens are important multifunctional spaces for greening the city, reducing household waste, strengthening community connectedness, enhancing food security, and encouraging healthy eating. The ubiquity of these allotments normalizes and democratizes the practice of edible gardening. Given how strongly people feel about edible gardening, it's not surprising that there was a palpable frustration with the unwillingness of local councils to allow edible gardening on verges and nature strips. A gardener in Ballarat who sees verges and nature, nature strips as wasted local resources writes that her council won't even discuss the possibility with her. Another gardener on Phillip Island in Victoria is too scared to approach her council because she expects them to say no. One Geelong re resident on a low income writes that the council is more focused on regulation than facilitation. She goes on to say elsewhere in the survey, that local councils could learn a lot from what is done successfully around the country, and I'd like to see them form a network for sharing policies and procedures that don't just facilitate, but actively encourage verge and community growing. Another gardener comments that the council focuses on potential hazards rather than the benefits of edible gardening. An older gardener suggests that making nature strips and other public areas available for food production, but also uh, making provisions for the allotment gardens in apartment buildings. This is where planning frameworks have a very important role to play for new developments as well as existing land that is zoned for public use. The use of such public land is often thwarted by narrowly defined parameters that require costly and time consuming planning permits. I'd like to wrap up this section with two points. Firstly, that there are few initiatives that local councils can support that touch on so many aspects of community well-being as edible gardening. Secondly, it's important to note that any attempt to expand access to edible gardening spaces, be they private gardens, verges and nature strips or public land, must acknowledge that these are in fact all traditional lands for which sovereignty was never ceded. We must therefore ensure that any agenda to expand access to land must engage with its traditional custodians, acknowledge the profound injustices that have, been, that have prevented them from accessing their own land since the colonization of this country, and work with relevant First Nations organizations to dismantle these barriers. So with that, I will hand over to Nick. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kelly, for taking us uh, through all of that. Um, wonderful uh, research and insights from the survey respondents as well as complementary uh, evidence and research from around Australia and around the world. Uh, just before we proceed to the final part of the uh, presentation and uh, then handing over to our, our panellists, just want to share with you the uh, results from the Mentimeter poll that uh, 52 of you have completed. Um, so the question was, what do you think are the top three obstacles to a major expansion of edible gardening and urban agriculture in Australia? 
and the six choices were lack of supportive policy framework at the local government level, lack of provision for urban agriculture in the planning frameworks at state government, culture of fear and risk aversion in government, lack of awareness of the benefits of urban agriculture in government, lack of financial and material resources, and competing priorities in land use. And we can see there the top three were uh, at state government level, level lack of provision um, in the planning frameworks. Secondly, lack of supported policy frameworks at local level. And then thirdly, lack of awareness of the benefits of urban agriculture and government. So it'll be really interesting because we've got a number of uh, people from local government um, who will be speaking shortly uh, to hear their perspectives on what they think are the obstacles and how they can be addressed. And that will in fact be a second Mentimeter poll which we'll be launching um, very soon. Um, however, um, it's now uh, over to me to complete um, the, uh, the presentation, which is now getting to the really the substance of the, um, of the issue, which is the action agenda for, um, for an expansion of uh, edible gardening and urban agriculture in Australia. It's our roadmap for transformation to make Australian towns and cities edible. So this, uh, this action agenda that we've developed is based on the tens of thousands of comments shared by respondents to the pandemic gardening survey, uh, a small handful of which um, you've just uh, seen and heard from uh, with Kelly. Uh, but in formulating this roadmap, we also draw on our own research and knowledge of this sector, as well as the accumulated experience and expertise of urban agriculture, community and school garden groups, networks and organisations. So first going back to the survey, we did ask respondents whether they intended to continue or expand their edible gardening activities. 98% of respondents said that they did, with many saying that they planned to very substantially increase those activities. However, over a quarter of respondents said that they needed more support in order to do so. So in terms of the support required, the most commonly expressed need was for knowledge, advice, mentoring and guidance. It's worth noting that over 70% of new gardeners, so that's those who started in the last year or those who've started since COVID, um, express this as their greatest need. This was followed by inputs and materials such as seed and compost. Third was access to land, followed by financial support and then tools and equipment. Finally, several gardeners mentioned physical assistance, which is especially important for people living with mobility challenges and disabilities. So turning now to our roadmap for transformation, we've set out six key pillars um, in this. Action in each is critical and taken together, we believe they form a comprehensive and achievable action agenda for a mass expansion in edible gardening across Australia. To realise this agenda, there must be a major shift in culture and values at the political level. We need our elected leaders and policymakers to commit to doing everything required to create a healthy and sustainable food system for all Australians. That means embracing the movement to regenerative agriculture. It means controlling the expansion of the fast food industry and controlling the marketing of unhealthy food and beverage products to children and youth. It means empowering individuals and communities to grow more of their own food. And it means embedding all of this and more in long-term food system strategies and plans that are created and implemented through inclusive, participatory and collaborative ways. So turning then to uh, the, each of the six uh, key pillars at a high level, and then we'll look at a little bit more detail. So firstly, urban planning and land use. Uh, we believe that edible gardening and urban agriculture needs to be explicitly recognised, supported and prioritised across all state and local planning frameworks. Next, um, and this is a, uh, our headline um, call to action, the establishment of a $500 million national edible gardening fund. Uh, there we are sharing with you an illustrative breakdown of how an annual allocation of $500 million could be spent. Um, as we've said before, we believe that governments, particularly federal and state, should resource this sector as a necessary and urgent investment in public and ecological health. As you just heard, so many respondents said that edible gardening has profound mental, nutritional and physical health benefits, and that's backed by a large body of evidence. The mass expansion of edible gardening will, we believe, save billions of dollars that will otherwise have to be spent dealing with these accumulating and metastasizing crises. 
We believe that this fund should be co-financed between federal, state and territory governments and the development industry itself. Next, um, as we've got in the room today, uh, and as all of you know through your connections and networks, there is an amazing wealth of knowledge and experience of edible gardening and urban agriculture in the Australian community, and it can be harnessed through coordination, facilitation and resourcing. Institutional capacity building is very important. Planners need to understand the intersection between urban food production, public and community health. Capacity needs to be built within councils to understand how different aspects of council operation intersect with and either support or hinder community wellbeing and healthy towns and cities. This will, we believe, help address the culture of fear and risk aversion uh, within many councils. Access to infrastructure and materials is critical, especially for members of low income households. This includes wicking and raised garden beds, quality soils of compost, tools, seeds and seedlings, connection to water, rainwater tanks and associated irrigation fittings, tool sheds, shade structures and so on, all of which can be funded through the National Edible Gardening Fund. So our vision is a rapid scaling up of urban food production across Australia. Supportive policy frameworks are required for this to happen. Based on respondents' experiences with councils in particular, this means both enabling action and removing barriers. All levels of government have a role to play. Canada and Britain have national food plans and Australia is lagging behind at the federal level in particular. While we know that edible gardening and urban food production activities are increasing, many individuals and groups are isolated, lack support, and often find themselves having to reinvent the wheel and bootstrap their initiatives through volunteerism, which frequently leads to burnout. It doesn't have to be this way, and if we want this sector to realise its potential, coordinated and collaborative governance and support frameworks will be essential. So turning now to a little bit more depth and detail on each of these six, six uh, uh, pillars. Um, so in these next six slides, we're gonna offer, offer to you four proposals in each of the six pillars uh, with corresponding stakeholder responsibility for each, followed by supporting comments from survey respondents. So on this question of urban planning and land use, uh, the question should be asked, why should urban food production be of major interest to planners? Research shows that planning has a critical role to play in this area. As Arif Sarkar and his colleagues in a 2018 article argue, urban food systems have profound effects on numerous areas of interest to planners, such as land use, transportation, economic development, local employment, provision of energy and water, air pollution, public health and social justice. So the question then needs to be asked, why do planners not take food issues into account when making decisions about land use? Victor Pires in a 2011 article argues that the reasons include lack of awareness of issues and responsibilities, lack of political will, time and financial constraints, conflict with other priorities, lack of planning, recognition for food and their limited sphere of influence. His analysis found that quote, most urban agriculture practices are regulated from a nuisance causing perspective, which results in prohibitions, obstacles and impracticable conditions. To facilitate urban agriculture recognition, local governments should invest in education, in particular on educating decision makers, planners and the community on its practices, benefits and risks. This is something we endorse wholeheartedly and was consistent with comments within the survey. Any coordinated and serious action to expand urban food production must work to challenge a culture of risk aversion that acts as a barrier rather than enabler all too frequently. Access to land is especially important for members of marginalised and low income communities. And this is vital for food security and dietary diversity and health as our survey overwhelmingly has demonstrated. So this is our headline proposal to support the health and well-being of communities around Australia. We propose a $500 million annual national edible gardening fund co-financed by governments and the development industry. We propose that the allocations from this fund 
be devolved to community level decision making through popular budgeting processes, as well as through joint council community committees. Consistent with respondents' comments, we further propose that innovative financing models be explored, tested and implemented to expand urban food production. This should include discounts on land tax and council rates for landowners who make their land available for urban and community food growing. It should also include social prescribing so that GPs and pharmacists can issue prescriptions for local and sustainable fresh food for healthcare card holders, as well as access to cooking and gardening classes. Such an allocation of public money would expand jobs and training in the labour intensive urban and sustainable agriculture sector, as well as make fledgling urban farm enterprises more financially viable. Our survey demonstrates that the support new and inexperienced gardeners most want and need is mentoring, guidance and information sharing. With most experienced gardeners being over 55 and many in retirement, there is a huge opportunity for facilitated and reciprocal intergenerational exchanges. Experienced gardeners can pass on their accumulated knowledge, wisdom and tips, and younger gardeners can provide assistance with more arduous and labour intensive tasks in the garden. At the same time, social connections and new friendships can form. Further, with the expanded capacity provided with the National Edible Gardening Fund, community garden networks and other groups can create and share a wealth of resources and knowledge. We are firm believers in the need for embedding edible gardening into the curriculum from primary to secondary school with a national target to reach universal food literacy by 2030. The knowledge and ability to grow some of your own food should be a core component for assessing levels of that literacy. There are also enormous opportunities at the post-secondary level for pre-accredited and accredited vocational training uh, uh, courses and pathways. However, as, as respondents stated, this knowledge and capacity building is especially important for our politicians and decision makers as it is for the next generation. Infrastructure, inputs and materials are also essential. Uh, these range, as I mentioned, from quality soil and compost to wicking and raised beds where contamination prevents in ground growing, to water connections, irrigation equipment, seedlings, mulch tools, sheds for storage and shade and shelter for socialising. With allocations from the National Edible Gardening Fund, local governments and community organisations can obtain and make available the necessary infrastructure to groups and members of low income households. As part of a national commitment to ending individual and household food poverty and insecurity, state governments should mandate that water connections for communal food growing be provided free of charge by water utility companies. As part of the same national commitment, as well as a commitment to move to zero waste and circular economies, we propose a mass expansion of community composting, as well as a mass education program to show the most effective and efficient ways to compost. In a similar vein and consistent with the vision of edible communal growing spaces within a 20 minute walk of every urban dweller in Australia, which uh, as some of you probably know, as part of uh, Plan Melbourne, we propose a national network of micro community uh, seed nurseries. Again, this can be financed with allocations from the National Edible Gardening Fund. With allocations from this fund, local governments and community organisations can obtain and make available the necessary infrastructure to groups and members of low income households. Uh, oops, uh, sorry. Um, so, uh, turning then to policies and plans, um, as many of you will know, Australia has committed to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal two is the ending of hunger. Similarly, Australia is committed to implement the universal human right to adequate and culturally appropriate food. Food is a basic right and need, and in a country as wealthy as ours, no one should be hungry, food insecure, forced to rely on charity handouts or poor quality produce. So we believe that we must embed and implement this commitment through national, state, territory and local policies and strategies. These policies and strategies must be created through participatory, transparent and inclusive processes, as has been done with the Cardinia Community Food Strategy, the Moreland Food System Strategy and the Bendigo Food System Strategy, amongst others. As this Sydney gardener suggests, urban farms and edible gardening should be provided for in local environmental plans and state environmental protection plans. 
As leadership and policy drivers are developed, we will build community support for this roadmap for transformation and reinvigorate our democratic culture, which has dramatically declined in the last 30 years. These policies and strategies must not gather cyber dust. They must be living and breathing documents monitored and reviewed with active community participation and implemented with dedicated food systems and food security officers at the local, state and territory level. Finally then to uh, our last pillar, governance and coordination. So what we've laid out for you this morning is an ambitious action agenda for transformation. Bringing to, the re to reality the vision of making Australian towns and cities edible will require the work of tens of thousands. It's already happening to some extent, but scaling it up to the level needed for systemic change will require coordination and collaboration at every level. This means staff, teams and departments within governments understanding how and why their respective work impacts the food system and coordinating their policies and programs accordingly. There's good precedent for this, for example, in the City of Yarra's Urban Agriculture Committee, which has representation from council and community stakeholders. In terms of building community capacity, leadership and facilitating the sharing of resources, equipment, uh, in information and knowledge. The suggestions made by many survey respondents regarding the formation of urban agriculture and similar cooperative structures have great merit and potential. These can be linked with and mutually support existing and emerging local food networks and movements, thereby accelerating the action agenda for whole of system transformation. Similarly, we strongly support the extension of this movement to schools via the formation of multi-school youth food security networks, which can draw inspiration from the leadership shown by last year's school strike for climate action. So uh, concluding now, we will return to our survey respondents and give the final word to them. So this uh, low income since COVID gardener from Melbourne says, I really hope we can shift towards the mainstreaming of urban food growing. This will take significant collaboration of many agencies, health bodies, local government, etc. Uh, this uh, older experienced gardener from Tasmania says, this is an opportunity to capture the narrative about the benefits of an active and sustainable lifestyle growing and producing food locally. It needs a strategy and a collaborative approach across public, private and not-for-profit sectors. And this new gardener from Melbourne says, with a growing healthcare budget, government should be developing preventative healthcare programs with edible food growing at the heart of the strategy. And finally, uh, this, uh, this uh, older experienced gardener from the Clare Valley in South Australia says, urban, and this is a vision for transformation of Australia's food system in its entirety, urban permaculture practices are the future. Monopolistic monocultures, which typify Australian rural agriculture, must go. Reforestation projects that would employ every un- and underemployed person in the country should be implemented immediately in all rural regions. Seed collection, nurseries and planting teams should be developed everywhere where the Indigenous landscape has been decimated by tillage, grazing and mining. This will rehydrate the land. Edible landscapes on broad scale and urban levels must be implemented along with community and publicly managed city farms and community gardens. These will be in schools, aged care facilities, in suburbs, towns and villages. So that concludes um, our uh, presentation. Um, what we're now gonna do, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, all our panelists, but before we're doing that, uh, I'm just going to share with you the uh, second Mentimeter question, and this is one for you, having heard our presentation and our thoughts on what an action agenda is. Uh, the invitation is for you to ask what action you can take in your role or in your community to support the expansion of edible uh, agriculture and edible urban agriculture and edible gardening, your top uh, two or three um, uh, action items for you personally. All right. Um, so now um, it's a very great pleasure to um, uh, to uh, introduce um, our panelists. Um, so just let me get uh, the order. I'm going to introduce them all and then share with you their uh, their slides. So I'll just get the um, the image up just a second. Um, so you can see that they're each going to be speaking uh, to some wonderful. Um, 
uh, pictures that capture what's going on in their communities. And uh, I'll just get that going for you. Hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce each of them. I'm going to do them all together and this will be the order in which they're going to speak. So first of all, we are delighted to be joined by Chris Cornish. Uh, he was a councillor at the City of Bayswater in WA between 2011 and 2019. During this time, he led the city to become the most progressive municipality in Australia with regard to edible plants on public land. Chris was equally passionate on tree management and during his time on council, he initiated a range of policies in order to better protect trees and ensure that many more are planted. Following Chris, we'll have Janet Willoughby. Uh, she is the open space community planner at the city of Charles Sturt in South Australia. Janet's worked in local government for over 30 years in a variety of roles, including bushland management, arboriculture, parks and gardens, operational management, strategic and community planning. Um, with a passion for collaborating with community to create successful gardens, including community gardens of all sizes and shapes and to empower and enable community to do amazing projects in areas of public open space. She's recently developed the Community Verge Development Policy Guidelines and Checklist, removing much of the bureaucracy from the process and enabling, encouraging edible streetscapes. Following Janet, we'll have Chris Martin, Community Connections Coordinator for the City of Onkaparinga, also from South Australia. Chris coordinates a team of community development officers who focus their work on a diverse array of place-based and issues-based projects and initiatives. With 11 years experience in community development, Chris observes that food growing initiatives have and continue to be a regular theme through consistent interest from community groups and residents. And he'll share the work of his team, that his team contribute to uh, food growing community gardens as well as Magic Harvest. Following Chris, we'll have Lee Tozzi, Food System Officer from the Moreland City Council. Lee has led sustainable food programs at Inner Melbourne Council since 2013. Um, uh, with Moreland, she's collaborated with community stakeholders to implement the council's first food system strategy since it was launched in October 2017. That strategy was a product of several years of community advocacy, discussion, negotiation and exploration. So the food system officer role is a facilitator and enabler for the council community relationships and partnerships. These are essential to achieving the shared goal of a healthy and diverse food culture and making nutritious food socially and economically accessible to all. all. In three years, the community and council have achieved some significant outcomes together, including six new community food growing sites. Uh, following Lee will be Heather Johnson, uh, urban forest advocate, Heller. Uh, Heather relishes advocating for the urban forest, sharing with all why they should love urban trees. Uh, in the last three years, she's volunteered over 5,000 hours of time to a number of initiatives that support the town's urban forest management and stewardship. She co-authored the town of Vic Park's urban forest strategy, including overseeing marketing, social media and education, and developing content for workshops, as well as coordinating the 40 volunteers that supported the project. Heather has become a recognised leader in Australian grassroots urban forestry and has made numerous presentations locally and internationally. She's continuing to volunteer with the town's urban forest implementation working group, Millennium Kids Inc and the Vic Park Urban Foresters to support greening initiatives that increase both urban tree canopy and build stronger communities. After Heather, we'll have Aidan Lang, councillor. I was elected as councillor for, city, for Fremantle City Ward in 2017. Um, after completing his Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management, Aidan joined the Department of Environment uh, in WA and worked on projects across the state. Following this, Aidan started, built and sold a handful of small businesses before entering the private sector and during this time completed a Master's and MBA at Curtin. In his first term as councillor, Aidan is going to focus his energy on projects that beautify Fremantle, make the city a thriving economic centre, increase foot traffic and ensure residents young and old have safe places to stay active and healthy. Since being elected, he has joined a planning services committee where he assists on decisions related to city planning and development and the Southwest Reference Group, where he will help implement the regional national resource management strategy for Fremantle. And then finally, we'll have Pete Olds um, uh, re from Reverge Community Verge Garden Projects. Pete is a Verge Garden advocate living in Perth. He founded Reverge Community Verge Garden Projects on Facebook to help share positive stories of people's verge adoption experiences across Australia and beyond. Pete is passionate about helping people transform verges into living green spaces that encourage native biodiversity, encourage the growing and sharing of produce and provide a vehicle for community capacity building. So thank you all to all of you for making your time available to share your perspectives this morning. And first of all, we will hand over to you, Chris. 
Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here. Um, I don't have very long. We've all only got like up to five minutes, so I'll get straight into it. Um, basically, in my eight years on council, uh, I moved a motion in 2015 to free up Burgess. To me, um, you know, that's just common sense. And I understand that we were the first local government to really hand over Burgess to the public or specifically to the adjacent landowner. Um, we created a, a one-page policy, which is really designed not to be a policy. Rather, it's just a few guidelines that if followed, just allow residents to walk out onto their verge and start planting whatever they like. So they don't have to come to council. There's no rules about the maximum height of plants. Um, you know, the guidelines just say, be mindful of sight lines. Um, but you can plant corn out there. You could put a raised garden bed. You could plant a lemon tree. And you could just go and do that now. So that was delivered um, early 2017. Um, the other thing that I did, and obviously one councillor can't do anything, you need the support of the majority of the council plus a, a local government that's willing to uh, embrace alternate ideas, was to allow local parks to be used by members of the public. So literally we, we've got a park a pocket um, garden policy and anyone can choose a section of their local park. They've got to apply to the local government for this, but it's a two page form. They submit that and they can literally take control of a small section of uh, unused um, a local park, plant some herbs or trees or veggies, however intensive they want to do. But basically it's all about getting public land to be able to be used by the public. Um, I was in a position, in the fortunate position to be able to do something about it. And uh, I'm very pleased with the result that was delivered. Um, I'd like to use my limited time here to pass on a couple of tips about how you could achieve change in your local government. To any councillor who's listening, just move a motion at council. I mean, my motion for the verge one was that officers roll out a, a method policy where residents are granted permission to grow appropriate food on their street verge. That gets the ball rolling and then stage two can come in. But, you know, that's an innocuous, non-controversial motion which will get the support of the majority of the councillors and, and hence get things happening. To anyone watching who's not associated or working for a local government but wants to see a local government cut the red tape, you've just got to find one person on your council. You just need one councillor who will share the same vision and move a motion and then drive some change. I mean, that one of the problems we've got is, I know that we've got a lot of people who work for a local government here. Unfortunately, when you work for a local government, you've got a manager and that manager's got a director and then the director's got a CEO above them. And any one of those people can put a halt to your brilliant idea. And so it's very hard for you sometimes to achieve the change that, that should be occurring, which is why I think the best method is for a councillor to just move a notice of motion and, and create a strategic vision for the local government. No matter how it's done though, um, you're gonna get pushback. And I wanna touch on some of the pushbacks that, that I received um, and how I overcame them. The first one being, you can't have plants over 50 centimetres or some local governments have 75 centimetres on the verges. And then my question is, well, why not? We allow cars and even vans to park on a verge and they're higher than 50 and 75 centi centimetres. So why do you have that rule and yet you allow cars and um, vans on the verge? It doesn't make sense. Either ban the vans or allow the plants over 50 centimetres. Um, when we tried to get insurance, because uh, uh, the insurers we use in WA, um, nobody had asked them, approached them about this, so we had to break new ground, so to speak. Um, and they pushed back on the raised garden beds. So it was important to me that we have raised garden beds on the verges, obviously for people who want to, you know, to use that. And they said, no, you can't do that. It's a trip hazard. Well, we went back and said, all around the parks, every park has got the, the little below post and rails to stop cars from going on the parks. 
If you're going to prevent us from having raised garden beds, then you also need to start preventing all local governments from those post and rails that they've all got to be removed. Obviously, that's, that was never going to happen. You know, you're not going to totally remove all the post and rails. So um, the insurer said, yeah, okay, fair point. We'll allow the raised garden beds. You know, with the pocket gardens, which is, you know, pretty out there concept to allow people to go and start planting on, on reserves. With the pocket gardens, the insurers came back and said, well, they're volunteers. If they're doing work on the gardens, that makes them volunteers, which means they need to have an induction and their work needs to be supervised. Well, we pushed back and said, well, no, the land is zoned recreation. Gardening is recreational, and hence they're just using the land for what it's zoned for. It's not, um, they're not volunteering, they're actually just uh, recreational uses, uh, which is gardening. So no matter what um, barrier is stuck up, and there will be barriers from either the staff or from the, from the insurers, you've got to push back. You've got to question because it's highly unlikely that the upper, um, you know, the CEO and the directors of the local government will have much libertarian in them on the whole bureaucrats don't. So they, you know, you've really got to do uh, a lot of questioning. That's my advice. Keep pushing back. You will, you will achieve results. That's me, Nick. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah, your experience is invaluable and congratulations um, in, in what you've achieved uh, at the City of Bayswater. You know, really outstanding and inspirational work. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, now I had a few issues before about the, the screen share and the presentation and Janet's um, given us some, uh, some pictures to speak to. So hopefully we're going to have success this time. Um, Janet, are you seeing what you're hoping that you're going to see there? With the... Uh, with that uh, picture? That's fine. Thank okay, you. all right, over to you, Janet. Okay, so maybe we'll just consider them as pretty pictures because I think what I've listened to has kind of thrown everything I was gonna say out. Um, so I guess I would open with um, supporting and agreeing with what we've heard this morning around the importance of the social infrastructure around, well, community gardens or um, community gardening groups, of which we have a number in Charles Sturt. Um, so we have um, we have five formal community gardens at the moment. The oldest one is 30 years old. Um, in the last three years, we've established three new gardens, all community driven. Um, and I have another two to deliver on um, by the end of the financial year. It's Janet No Life. Um, we have 10 community gardening groups. So that's groups similar to Chris's pocket park people. Um, so they do predominantly ornamental gardening, but generally around the bee, butterfly, pollinator style gardens, and mostly along railway corridors. So it's quite extensive areas that they plant and maintain, and they predominantly um, propagate their own plants as well. Um, but I guess the, the important one for today is our new um, policy guidelines and checklist for community verge, as we call it here in South Australia development. I'd much rather that it was called the nature strip, like Eastern states call it, but we call it the verge. Um, so we've recently had that endorsed by council. And um, in line with what Chris was talking about, it was an arduous process. It took over two years to get this policy up and running, dealing with the risk, the legislators, the um, how we get around the permit process, because you have to have a permit here under by legislation, because you're working in the road reserve. Um, and that process could take three or four weeks council officers going out and inspecting, residents providing um, designs for their, their verge. And it was just such a bureaucratic process that it, it really put people off doing anything. And unlike um, Eastern States verges, here in South Australia, it's a very um, common held thought, feeling attitude that the nature strip or verge is council property. People don't mow it. They'll have manicured front yards and they'll have a verge often that is you know, up to your hips at this time of year when you get a bit of spring 
rain and sun. Um, so it's getting people to actually do anything in their village is quite a process. But council has recently endorsed um, veggies in verges and we're um, encouraging people to talk to their neighbours and actually treat it as a community garden. So possibly we can start getting community gardens happening in street. Um, so we're starting our first street community garden currently, that's, that's happening. That'll all be in raised planter boxes, which is also part of what was endorsed by council recently. Our guidelines have um, links to plant selectors and soil testing at Macquarie Uni. I think it's around $20 for people to do that. So pretty much what I tried to do was work. Every time we had a knocker, whether it was, you know, dogs will wee on your, your veggies or, <laughs> or people are gonna trip or kill themselves on, on theirs or they won't be able to see over them, was working through the process and getting agreement at all levels um, just to make it happen. Um, so I guess uh, from that perspective, um, it, it is, it's, it's at least here, it's a difficult process. Um, we have gardens in reserves, such as the ones that you see here, which are um, community gardens that are not formal. So we've got informal and formal community gardens. These ones um, sit in the middle of reserves and um, the one in particular, the two little ones on the bottom there are in what is called, they call it the plant about, and it's a big road reserve. It's an intersection of four roads and they've just turned it into a thing of great beauty and it produces an enormous amount of food. Um, they have community composting in there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I just never cease to be amazed at, at the commitment and uh, the, the, the creativity of our community around food spaces on public open space. So I think I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I hope that was helpful to some degree, but I think the, the key really is about um, being persistent. And I'm, I'm looking at these verges that you can see on the screen now, and they're just fantastic. And the, the amount of produce that is coming out of these and it's shared by the community, it's fabulous. I'd better leave it there, I've gone over time. <laughs> Thanks very much, Janet. Um, yeah, congratulations on your work in the city of Charles Sturton. Those are, yeah, those are really inspirational images. And um, as you say, you know, the the, the productivity that can be um, obtained mm. through these very kind of like small spaces and small gardens is um, phenomenal, as well as the demonstrative impact that, um, that that edible gardening in public space has. So those are fantastic examples. And thank you for sharing your experience and lessons. Um, now we're going to uh, also stay over in South Australia and Chris Martin from the city of Onkaparinka is going to join us. Uh, Chris. Hi everyone. Uh, is this the image that you want to speak to, this one here or? Yeah, if we um, just start with the first one there. Uh, uh, sorry, just let me. This one? Sorry, yeah. Um, no, that's mine. No, that's. Um, that's, uh, oh, this one. Yeah. Imagine yeah, us. Probably not that one. That would be no? my last one. Number three, number one, there. Oops, Beautiful. sorry. This one? Yep. Yeah, that can be number one. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm feeling very overwhelmed to be, and it's just fantastic to hear all that research and the survey results and greetings from Ghana country. Uh, I'm representing uh, Linda Enright today, who is our food security or food sustainability officer, um, who has a big work, I guess a big focus on our internal capacity building here at Council. So I, I work in our community development team and we take a community development approach with our residents and with other teams. Uh, the teams work with internal stakeholders has improved the way we go about food growing initiatives. I guess there's a classic quote in our work, uh, we build our communities from the inside out. And this is certainly true in this case. Uh, internally to council, my team has championed food growing work in two areas which have improved opportunities for our residents to undertake food growing activities. We're a big council with a lot of staff um, and a lot of teams, um, and we still have plenty of room to improve. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we need to keep working on changing the focus um, as 
as Kelly mentioned, um, from taking the focus away from hazards and focusing on benefits. So we've identified that years ago and we, we keep chipping away at that and we've had some good successes. So we certainly support food-led food growing, community-led food growing initiatives with community gardens and verge planting and recognise its place absolutely with social interactions in neighbourhoods, place making and building of community connections while providing locally produced foods. So we've got a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Currently uh, we, we have some um, guidelines for for community gardens, so how people can go about creating a community garden in our city. We currently provide for 11 community gardens on council land, and there are about an additional eight community gardens provided by other community groups, such as churches and schools. Our community group are also currently exploring a new site. The gardens connect to community centres, um, are usually more heavily supported by staff to support community garden costs and tend to volunteer needs. There's some other sites that are certainly a lot more independent um, of staff and work um, alone with some minimal support. Uh, the community good development team um, led the development of the community garden guidelines, um, really to provide the community with a clear process and to support us in processing any requests it was really difficult to get um, some clarity on how people can go about that. So this guideline just sort of pulled everyone together and, and pulled all the information into one place. So it's about helping us more so than community members to, to navigate that. And we also, it also provides a consistent and coordinated response across our city and across our internal teams. So the other document um, is Road Verge guidelines and we've heard from um, about this already. Um, so, you know, so the purpose of these guidelines are to outline our obligations and to assist residents and us in meeting our shared responsibilities to provide information on what we can and cannot do on, on an urban road verge. Um, these guidelines support um, a number of uh, fruit and nut trees also, which is a, a great little win to have um, because, uh, you know, there's a perception that they made a lot of mess and maintenance and all that sort of stuff. So to have some on the list is a great start. Um, so look, um, we're now focusing on um, a verge growing pilot with local, res re local residents to capture their stories and promote benefits of verge growing. Um, we also want to develop a warm user-friendly guide for verge yeah, growing. Ours yeah. is still very, very hard, I guess. Um, there's another South Australian council, City of Unley, who have a beautiful guide, uh, which I can share with you. It's just fantastic. And I also understand that City of Unley have a spot where residents can go to look at demonstration gardens that they've set up on how you can set up your verge with different themes, one of them being a butterfly garden. And we're also looking at the establishment of a community garden network to provide a uh, space for transfer of knowledge, advice, mentoring and guidance, which is something which I picked up on your last uh, webinar. So it's something we've had in the past. We haven't at the moment, but we would like to reinstate that. So over to Magic Harvest next, Nick. Um, just quickly, this is a program that was developed by Tori Arbon based on Lolo Lou Bain's book, One Magic Square, and we bank, began this work in 2012. So participants grow food in their own gardens, starting with one square metre plots in their backyards. So they meet regularly at a central hub, that can be one of our community centres or community gardens, I should say, and learn step by step how to grow and cook in a series of workshops. The practice of pass it on and produce swap are key components. Sharing information becomes a vital um, support network for each other and the broader community. The legacy continues. Uh, the, the community have really driven this, uh, still supported by Tory, who continues to nurture it locally. And we provide small amounts of funds to groups, particularly at startup. We currently have 15 coordinators trained and currently have three active hubs. 
And in closing, um, and sorry, the third slide, he's some quotes there on the Magic Harvest experience for people. And that really has been um, a great way of supporting residents to get confident with, with growing um, by connecting with each other and connecting yeah. with a hub and connecting with some, some good advice from people who are experienced. But in closing, um, I guess, as our name suggests, community development, we, we really love the resident-led resident work. It's the stuff that keeps the team coming back each day. Um, as resident-led work is the key to our approach and we support this over diverse community interests in the food space. We have a resident-led collaborative that organises themselves to collaborate, share, info, advocate and map across our city with food security and food systems work. A recent success was their advocacy through approaching our mayor for a stronger commitment from us in this space with our new uh, strategy plan. And just referring to Chris Cornish's comments on elected member involvement and um, and that, that thing of taking a motion to the chamber. What we certainly find here is if community uh, residents uh, work with elected members through deputation, with a follow-up motion, um, it's incredible what can happen. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, guys. Great, great. Thanks very much, uh, Chris, and uh, really good practical advice in terms of um, yeah, getting getting action and progress happening through council, and obviously um, yeah, some really um, inspiring work with the, the Magic Harvest and, and other programs here on Kapringa. Um, now we'll come over to Melbourne and uh, hear uh, briefly from Lee Tozzi about what's been happening at the City of Moreland. Lee. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Chris, and the other speakers. Really, really inspired by all of the work happening um, across uh, the country. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, talk today about three different uh, case studies in Moreland uh, quickly. Um, and I guess my key message is around each of these uh, um, that characterises all of these are the role of council in really facilitating strong community relationships um, and doing this by really providing clear, transparent and timely um, uh, processes and sharing those and, and also um, decision making around, around all of this. So we've really tried to work hard on that and also build uh, internal relationships across departments to provide a more coordinated response, similar to what Chris mentioned just now. Also, um, we really strongly support a community-led and collective impact approach. Um, um, we found that to be the most effective in, in getting uh, sustainable um, food growing and other local food initiatives up and running. And in all of these cases, uh, I just want to emphasize the multifunctional and the interconnected interconnected and reinforcing reinforcing benefits that each each uh, uh, demonstrate because this to me is about how we have the resilience and the longevity in um, many of these initiatives. So I'll start with uh, uh, Moreland Community Gardening Incorporated which is this first photo here. Uh, they are uh, a community gardening governing body established for more than 15 years and, um, and well, be, well before my time and before uh, the creation of the food system strategy. In fact, this, this organization were instrumental in actually advocating over the best part of a decade to support the creation of the food system strategies. They had a really strong adv advocacy role in that. Um, and uh, over these many years, they have played an absolutely essential role in supporting governance and mentoring of a number of community gardens, um, including the West Brunswick Community Garden, the Dunstan Reserve Food Forest, which you see pictured here, and the Pentridge Community Garden. And are uh, also looking at bringing others under their wing basically with the, um, I guess, reasoning that they have so much experience and 
have a lot of documented processes that why wouldn't they actually share that and, and, and um, ensure other groups don't have to start from scratch. Um, council's role has been to provide organisational funding for, for this group. Uh, as well as developing a strong relationship with them and um, emphasise that this takes a lot of time to get that trust and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ability to kind of uh, work together. And uh, really um, uh, through them, because they're the ones that have the experience, uh, uh, really support uh, a number of community garden sites across, across Moreland. Uh, I would also like to mention that, you know, uh, we have uh, really tried to educate and highlight the circular economy through providing free bulk compost across a whole lot, a range of community gardens through the Back to Earth program, which is made from our household green and organic waste. And um, also mentioned that throughout COVID-19, we've worked really closely with Moreland Community Gardening Incorporated and other community gardens to ensure that they could continue operating under safe COVID arrangements without disruption. And there has been absolutely no, um, you know, uh, issues or concerns raised uh, under, the, under the very um, strict lockdown conditions that we've had here. So uh, all credit to those groups for working with us on that. So I might work, uh, move now to the next picture, if I may, Nick, or whoever's in charge. Thank you. Oh, whoops, yes, beautiful. So now what we have pictured here is an organisation called Faulkner Food Bowls. And I uh, just want to acknowledge the wonderful photo by um, uh, Gregory Lorenzuti, who's a arts, professional arts photographer, but not at the moment, of course, under COVID-19 but is now a permaculturist in this beautiful um, growing space. This, this uh, uh, example was started by two passionate new local Faulkner residents uh, who uh, were concerned about a lack of places to connect in Faulkner. This is in 2017 and they partnered with council to undertake a neighborhood project co-design um, uh, studio uh, exercise which focused on how we could actually activate uh, this disused bowling green which is pictured here uh, at the Faulkner, Faulkner Bowls Club and turn it into an edible oasis for the community to gather, socialise, grow and celebrate food together. So social cohesion uh, is the primary goal and the food growing is actually the mechanism by which social cohesion is, is brought to life. So it's a very much a community led uh, project by Faulkner residents for Faulkner residents. So very localized and responding to the, the uh, really uh, variety, the, the huge diversity of cultures that are represented in Faulkner. So council has supported the, the, the this, uh, project to take a very much a staged pro approach because it does take time to get, get these things running sustainably. Uh, so really fostered the, and brokered that partnership with the Bowls Club through an MOU and provided a capital works grant for the infrastructure. Uh, and this coincidentally has had the knock on effect of really boosting the Bowls Club social membership and uh, which was really dwindling away. So really, really great side benefits there. So a social cohesion grant was also provided to engage the diverse community through a number of different activities. And uh, most recently, the, the strong um, founding relationships have enabled this group to mobilize and adapt extremely quickly to create a food distribution center to supply culturally diverse, low cost subsidized and free food boxes during COVID-19. Um, so we've been able to establish a lease agreement, uh, changes, uh, get environmental health sign off, provide seed funding and networking with uh, other food relief agencies all in the space of really weeks. So I think that's a really great example of what can happen when we work together. And lastly, I, yes, thank you. My last example is the Ecological Justice Hub 
which is uh, a centre run by the Jesuit Social Services in Brunswick, suburb of the southern suburb of Moreland. It's been uh, uh, a education and service hub centred around a permaculture garden for quite a number of years, and they're dedicated to both social and environmental justice. So we came to know about them in the last couple of years, and most recently during COVID, where uh, our food relief meal and food distribution services across Poland were severely disrupted. So they've mobilized very quickly um, to produce organic, nutritious, vegan meals. Um, so this is mid-April and they've been utilizing the organic garden produce from their permaculture garden and really ramped up produce in that garden um, and then put that through a commercial kitchen uh, with professional uh, volunteer chefs. And, um, They've, enabled, they've been able to ramp up to, to feeding 50, 50 households with culturally appropriate food. Um, they've developed a really strong relationship with council and, and um, I've been able to help them with environmental health support to ensure they're able to do this safely. And uh, they've collaborated with other food relief providers to share they were successful in um, getting 13 staff through a state government program called Working for Victoria to uh, be able to work right across the food relief, um, including uh, at Fort, Faulkner Food Bowls to, to really um, uh, uh, increase the amount of food that's grown locally and provide that logistics and delivery staff needed to get this out to the right people. And uh, I just want to mention that they're always thinking about pathways to food security through this process. So in engaging with their clients, they're uh, talking to them about um, what sort of skills they might uh, be able to take on. They've been invited to and provided with the ingredients to come along to a zero waste cooking class and then start to talk to them about whether there's employment pathways through their um, ecological justice hub um, training programs. So really three fantastic examples there. And uh, I just uh, think that through these relationships with these community groups, community led practice is, is really what, how we're really being able to see this success. And one last quick mention, there's a new group that's formed in Moreland called Growing Farmers, which is brand new. And I know we've got somebody in the, uh, webinar today who's, who's part of that group, they're um, all about regenerative community-led urban farming and they've got a new project connecting um, private space, growing space with aspiring urban farmers. So I'm really excited to be in. Fantastic. That's, yep. um, yeah, fantastic, Lee. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, really uh, love the way you describe it there, community-led uh, practice and the role of council being to enable and facilitate and um, yeah, what's happening in Moreland and those case studies that you mentioned um, are really you know, brilliant examples of um, the sort of collaborative approach um, that is making you know, such great impacts now and such great potential for, for scaling. So uh, thank you. And now we're gonna go back over to the other side of the country and learn about somebody who is from the community perspective and has very much been a kind of a driver and generator of uh, really significant and substantial change where she lives in the town of Victoria Park and that is Heather Johnston. So Heather, um, over to you for a few minutes to talk about what you've been doing with hey, urban hi. forestry. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Wadjuk Mungar land and pay my respects to uh, the uh, custodians of the land. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and keep this really, really brief and, and uh, knock it out in a few minutes. Um, I'm basically part of the team that led uh, a community-led urban forest strategy within the town of Victoria Park. So whereas Chris was talking before about an elector's motion uh, triggering change within the community, we went uh, from the other way around. Uh, we started a petition um, to trigger a special, um, special meeting of electors which then uh, residents could put forward their own motions at that particular type of meeting. One of the motions uh, among many was that the town develop an urban forest strategy um, to uh, increase the tree canopy within the town of Victoria Park. 
the petition, the catalyst for the petition was basically from a, a large development which saw 8,000 square metres of mature tree canopy removed from a site within the park to make way for a football ground. Uh, so there was a lot of community uproar um, and that, that's basically what led to the petition. Uh, so there was a little bit of, uh, I guess, bureaucracy that uh, delayed that a little bit, not by very long, by about nine months between uh, that motion being endorsed and the urban forest strategy working group actually getting together and, and starting on the work. The process that we went through um, was an expression of interest uh, and request for quote. Um, and the community group who uh, became part of the Urban Forest Working Group, as we, we were known, was a partnership between two community groups. One of them was uh, Vic Park Trees, who is an urban tree advocacy group. And there's also uh, Vic Park Collective, who are essentially a placemaking um, group as well. So we, we partnered uh, for what we were hoping was going to be about a 12 month process. It ended up being a little bit longer, around 15 months. Uh, the volunteers, uh, of which we had around 40, contributed 3,600 hours of, of their time to uh, develop that project. Uh, so we basically started off with a whole bunch of research, then we did some community consultation and it really got a feeling of the priorities within the community. Um, as you can see by this image, uh, we did some participatory planning uh, workshops where uh, we had abstractions of different types of uh, land use areas within the town. So this shows a residential area. We also had uh, an industrial area represented and also a commercial um, shopping precinct as well. Um, and through uh, those workshops, we had uh, some really, really good uh, information about priorities of residents. Uh, we had quite a diverse group of um, ethnicities as well as ages as well. Uh, we ran a youth, um, youth only workshop as well. And we really asked them to do a lot of uh, future visioning as well. So not just looking at what we can do immediately now, but you know, what do they want the town to look like in you know, 50, 100, 500 years time? Uh, and the kids came up with some pretty um, amazing creations, lots of flying cars and um, you know, fantastic community spaces within, within their visions. Um, so if you wanna jump onto the next slide and then I'll, I'll kind of fast forward past the endorsement and I uh, move into um, the implementation of the urban forest strategy. So the urban forest strategy was endorsed in uh, 2018. So that was uh, yeah, just about uh, 15 months or so after the, the work started. Um, and now basically we're putting all the trees in the ground. Um, the urban forest strategy only briefly touches on uh, urban ag and food security, just because that's the priorities that were, um, uh, you know, the, the priorities that were particularly relevant in our area were increasing tree canopy and uh, bringing nature and biodiversity back to the community. So there are mechanisms within the strategy to support uh, increasing urban ag and food security, but they're not quite as heavily focused on uh, just because that, that was the priorities within the, the group. Um, so some of the initiatives that have, have occurred since we've begun uh, implementing the strategy and along with the strategy came quite a nice uh, budget as well. So it's uh, $5 million over five years uh, that the town has committed to investing into increasing urban canopy. Uh, uh, there's been uh, tree giveaways. Uh, there's been a huge increase in the number of trees planted on, on verges, uh, community stewardship uh, programs such as um, uh, community watering. Sorry, my phone's just gone off. Um, and uh, yeah, a whole, a whole range of, too much to talk to in just a, the few minutes that we have. Um, I'll, pop up uh, a link in the chat just about um, 
you know, where you can find out more information about the urban forest strategy. Um, the I've just just seen a, a comment about uh, ongoing support. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of work in the background uh, to really ensure that there's uh, long term stability. So we, we do have this this five years of of works where you know, this, this funding is guaranteed, uh, money that isn't spent can then get rolled over into next year's budget. Um, so it's it's going to be really quite quite stable, which is, is pretty amazing. So even if there is a change in elected members, uh, this this particular, uh, you know, body of work will uh, definitely get completed. So we're, we're looking at um, increasing the tree canopy from you know around about 10 percent where it sits at the moment up to 20 percent uh, we do have um yeah extremely low tree canopy so once we get those uh large trees in then we can start looking at understory planting as well um yeah so i'll yeah just another photo of a, a community event um we had about uh, 120 residents turn up, the, the town put on some food and some entertainment and um, the uh, West Coast Eagles uh, came down and, and did some planning. You can probably see a bit of blur of blue in the background, that's the, uh, the football players. Um, so from this, um, which is quite a nice, a nice sort of circle, I guess, going from the, um, the football ground that basically was the catalyst for all this tree removal and now the um, football club is is now starting to realise that, um, you know, they can help heal the community as well through uh, contributing to, to tree planting and, and these other initiatives as well. So, yeah. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, thanks so much, Heather. That's, um, yeah, uh, a real um, legacy that, that you and your uh, fellow residents and the, the town have created there with collaborations from um, you know, broader stakeholders such as the football club. Um, and it's a yeah an, an amazing uh, achievement and um, yeah a really interesting context as you say sparked by a proposal to uh, um, do a mass removal of trees for an urban development um, you know the way you sort of turn that around and turn it into a you know the fantastic opportunity and initiative that it is uh, so important on so many levels particularly when we're talking about climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation and you know reducing the urban heat island effect. And quality of life and all those um, intersections is really uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to stay in Perth and, and head over down to the port, um, the beautiful uh, city of Fremantle, and be joined by Councillor Aidan Lang, who's going to talk to us briefly about um, uh, change within council and what's happening in, in Fremantle. Um, over to you, Aidan. Thanks, Nick, and thanks for having me. Um, look, the first thing I want to comment on is we've had a pretty broad range of discussion already. So a lot of, I won't repeat on what anyone else has said. Um, but the key things I want to really focus on about driving home, about enabling the community when it comes to verge gardens, whether it be a native garden or an edible garden, um, is what is what Chris, Chris touched on. And that's supporting and enabling our community champions to achieve what they want to achieve, to achieve what's important to them in their street, enabled, Wood or their block. And this screenshot we've got, uh, we're showing here, uh, is something that we're working on right now. It's, it's a live project. Um, Barnett Street in Fremantle, there's this little, there's a piece of green grass at the end of the street. Uh, the neighbourhood want to put a community garden on there. The bit bounded by red is, is owned by main roads. So, I mean, if you're in local council, all the policy in the world we can create um, is one thing and we can say yes you can have a verge garden um, but often councils around Australia are quite risk averse and um, there is a bit of a, a no a no culture so to speak so what we're trying to foster at the moment is a yes culture um, yes we want to put it a community garden here uh, we acknowledge it's not our land it's owned by main roads how can we work with main roads and your community on street to make what you want to happen happen so I keep coming back um, to what the opening speaker, Chris, was talking about, um, enabling community champions. We want to uh, push down the barriers that stand in front of people. Um, all, the, all the positive benefits we discussed about community gardens can be undone or, or can be prevented if the garden never exists in the first place. And 
in our community, uh, I, I fear that um, if someone approaches about creating a large pocket garden or community garden and one council officer says no, um, are they turned away? Uh, are they gone forever? And is that opportunity lost? Um, the real community champions, some of them are relentless and don't give up. Um, and that project will become available. But this is about creating the yes culture and about enabling the community champions to come forward and execute their projects wherever they might be. Um, we need to enable as councillors um, and members of the community, we need to enable these ideas and we need to enable this passion that exists. Um, and what we've been doing in Fremantle by allowing Verge Gardens to pop up and by helping Verge Gardens to pop up, it encourages that culture. And, oh, the, the person down the road's created a Verge Garden. How did you do that? Sharing, community collaboration, um, and and really, and dare I say it, um, if I'm allowed to say it, I, I do encourage a little bit of gorilla planting off the record, on the record, but, um, you know, you do, we just have to, you get one community garden going and one verge garden going, it enables the one next door and the one next door. So um, all the policy aside, um, if, we, if we don't enable community champions to start these projects, we won't get all the positive benefits that have been discussed today. So um, we can impact change at a local level. We can impact change at council that's driven nationally uh, and, or internationally. So, um, my advice to councillors that are listening or other people in the community, if you've got a vision or someone's coming with an idea, don't give up. Um, enable, 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 help. Um, get one of these projects up because if you get one up, you're going to get 10 or 100 up. So um, support your community champions is my message. Thanks, Nick. Amazing, Aidan. Thanks very much. Um, that was uh, super um, succinct and um, really important messages and, and, and great um, great lessons uh, and insights there. And as you say, the best policy in the world isn't going to help if um, if there are barriers in the way. And um, you know that that culture change. Um, love the way you described that pushing down the barriers um, is absolutely fantastic. And certainly, when I was in Frio. A few years ago, the kinds of things that are happening there are pretty, are pretty extraordinary and phenomenal, including having goats um, in uh, in one standout um, uh, property, the Eco Verbia site um, with Shani, Shani and Tim, and I'm sure there's so many other fantastic examples of what's going on in Fremantle. So, um, last, uh, we're going to stay in in Perth with uh, with Pete. Um, who's going to share with us um, uh, the, the the story work and, and networking he's been doing and in, in sharing inspirational stories around Verge Gardens. Um, over to you, Pete. Pete, uh, are you still with us? There you go. I'm, I'm unmuted. Yep, you're unmuted. Yep, we got gotcha. you. Okay. Good morning to uh, everyone in WA and possibly... Uh, your sound's a little bit, um, haven't quite got your sound, Pete. I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure uh, uh, what's happened to Pete's um, sound there, but maybe while he's um, uh, seeing if he can um, um, uh, work that one out. Um, I might be able to just kind of quickly take you through. Um, we'll come back to you in a moment, Pete, but I'm just going to um, quickly show everybody what happened with the um, uh, your responses, the action agenda um, that you created for yourselves um, in terms of um, what two or three actions can you take right now to advance edible gardening and urban agriculture in your role or community. Um, so here we have uh, not-for-profit community activists, community um, advocating for our local reserve to become an urban edible garden and my child's school to introduce a kitchen garden program, uh, Verge Garden educators and government, um, University of Adelaide, uh, establishing community gardens, live by example, um, Offer edible garden package in my business community. Uh, Pete, if you're back online, when you've got your sound, just let me know and we'll, we'll switch back to you. Um, just, just going through this while we're waiting for you to get your sound. Um, um, education and business sector, continue work in brownfields, remediation for edibles, uh, pursue research, enabling a strong evidence base for policy translation, 
share passionate gastronomic narratives to inspire, um, continue capacity build, connect and network, mentor, train our social housing gardeners, focus on remote drought and fire affected regions, community greening, New South Wales, state government, corporate partnership and education community development, um, education workshop sessions on how to grow, cook food, uh, local government increase education knowledge sharing through more community workshops, activities on edibles, promote community gardens available in the municipality to a wider audience. Um, uh, continue, this is from Geelong, continue working in the neighbourhood garden, uh, created the Hearn Hill um, garden, recognised by the City of Greater Geelong and Transition Streets Geelong. Uh, local government map available of land for urban agriculture. It's a really important point, and that was something Arif Sarka was uh, talking about as well, an audit of land that's available in every municipality um, and classifying it as in terms of its suitability for different types of uh, community food growing and urban agriculture. Um, here's one, advocating to council. This is particularly relevant to Victoria right now with the cycle that we're in on developing municipal health and public wellbeing. Um, to build community capacity to lead, community initiatives to grow their own food, uh, continue to co-implement Northeast local food strategy in our region. Um, uh, local government advocate to my workplace for expanded services, provide workshops, events and resources for you, start a seed library, push toward a library of things, fantastic. Um, so I think Pete's uh, rejoined us. Just, um, Pete, just check to see if we can hear you and if you've got your sound back. Uh, testing. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, just have another go. Testing. Yep. Yeah, that sounds go. good, Pete. All right. Okay. We'll uh, swap back to you now. Um, go back to that uh, that image there. All right, Pete. Tell okay. us about tell us about Burgess. Ap apologies and uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay. So uh, quickly, I was inspired through seeing a number of stories in the media about uh, everyday residents going about trying to do a verge garden and coming up against red tape. Uh, did a lot of research, started my own little uh, story on Facebook, uh, which I did to help inspire my local community to uh, work within the boundaries and uh, maybe push against them a little bit and uh, challenge the paradigm. So uh, part of uh, what my inspiration was, as you see in the background here, is do what you can where you are with what you have. Keep it simple, start small, and utilize the power of grassroots movements, um, advocate positively with your local uh, neighbors, uh, friends, counselors, uh, and basically all your stakeholders in your community. Here's an example of uh, where we got together and uh, with some funding that we uh, managed to get through uh, grants, uh, support from National Tree Day and so forth. Um, we, we tried to build some showcase examples uh, within our communities of uh, getting people together, um, some local experts and people from community gardens and so forth and, and start some uh, verge gardens within the boundaries being over here, uh, a lot of support for water wise native verge gardens. So uh, leveraging what we have at the start and then slowly moving towards edibles. Uh, so over time, uh, basically built a network of people through my little group We've started, uh, we've got about 3,000 people now over about four or five years across Australia and New Zealand and beyond. People taking interest in what we do here from a policy point of view, with uh, sharing great examples like those from Chris of the city of Bayswater, um, the city of Fremantle, um, town of Vic Park, some of the great work there with uh, urban forestry. Same with that with um, the, the city of Stirling um, and uh, basically building a network. So what, what I care to share and the lessons that uh, I've taken out of my experience is to um, reinforce the positive and, and look, meeting people like uh, the, the Verge Garden champion Costa, he, he just helps reinforce that thing is focus on the positive, show what you can do, go with the basics and then um, build build that arsenal of positive examples and then present them to your um, council. And, and basically through our little group that we've created on Facebook, um, we have been able to help people uh, even on the East Coast, um, like Chris has with getting involved in the, the urban food street um, debate over East. Um, on, on a small scale, our group has helped uh, residents on, on 
different parts of Australia, collaborate, to, uh, collect information, present it to their council, help challenge the paradigm and, and move ever so slowly to, to help convince councils that don't even have verge policies and are still stuck in the 80s um, or even beyond uh, with making sure that, you know, during drought times that uh, we have to have a fully manicured lawn and that's all your options are. So basically, we're here to show what people can do with what little resources they have, enable them to get grant funding, um, encourage them to con connect with so many different organisations like, like um, all the examples that we've seen here, community gardens, pocket gardens, transition towns. We seem to have a lot of people doing a lot of similar things, but we need to work better collectively in order to uh, collaborate and um, build that momentum. So I guess, yeah, my, my takeouts here are small and simple solutions, be positive, um, show what you can do and, and help educate people along the way. Um, part of my mission was to, to get people together and have discussions. Here you see a, uh, an example of a flyer we had and, and every year we've tried to get local examples of um, business, business people who are actively involved in verges, uh, council officers, mayors, uh, advocates for verge gardens, um, guerrilla gardeners, people who uh, challenge the paradigm, um, and also people who have, like this picture here is uh, an example in the city of Bayswater where people basically adopted a street, they've put in, they've um, taken over and um, been allowed to adopt part of what was, uh, I guess, idle land from a, um, how can we say, uh, a, I can't remember the name of it anyway, but yeah, uh, basically, a, a block of flats, vacant land there. They, they've planted trees, they've planted edibles, they've planted natives, they've put park benches in, they've made uh, engaging public spaces and, and providing living examples where people can come and learn and see that it's not the end of the world. What we need in, on every street corner is, is these little examples of where people can make positive change and have some sustainability in uh, living the example. Um, so yeah, that's basically been my mission um, to, to connect people like Heather, like Chris, like Aidan, uh, like Lee, like Janet and, and get them talking, sharing the examples and, and learning from each other and not having to do all the hard work over and over again. So hopefully with all the great work Sustain's doing, we can move from just only water-wise uh, verge gardens and, and local native biodiversity to, to feed our, uh, I guess, our diminishing fauna but also to help feed uh, the people on the street and more importantly feed their mental health feed their community connectedness and to build more resilient communities that um, we actually get to know our names of each other and, and wave and uh, can actually uh, borrow that old cup of sugar or um, you know maybe in future some uh, some peas some beans and uh, a pumpkin thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, look us up uh, just look up Verge Gardening, Verge Garden Projects Australia, Reverge on Facebook. Please join us and uh, look forward to your contributions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pete. That's absolutely fantastic. And um, I loved your um, your uh, your background there. Um, uh, do you want to just kind of like bring it, uh, just 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 uh, bring yourself back up? I just uh, want to see what you had there behind you. It was um, do what you can where you are with what you have. I think it's absolutely a fantastic um, motto because uh, there's yeah there's there's absolutely so much that we can do right now um, and what you're doing is really uh, demonstrating that uh, in a really a really powerful way and that's what we're about as an organization and that's what this morning's been about is really building those relationships connecting um, people across the country uh, within communities sharing positive stories and inspiring change and you know our hope from today is that uh, you know what, what Kelly and I have laid out with the, the research from the survey with our agenda that we're taking forward into the Urban Agriculture Forum and the Urban Agriculture Month uh, next April. And I uh, would encourage all of you uh, to look at that in terms of doing what you can. Uh, we have got uh, a call to action out right now uh, for people to get involved in the Urban Agriculture Run Month to really, as we've done today, shine a spotlight on the fantastic things that are happening around the country to celebrate leadership that's happening at community and, and local government level. Um, you know, all across this uh, this land, um, the people doing things like we're seeing on the screen right now, uh, adopting a street, adopting a park, 
adopting a verge, transforming it, um, you know, connecting, making friendships, uh, you know, embracing an ethic of care and stewardship, um, because that's, you know, that's the work that's needed right now. Um, and that's the work that we want to support and, and help scale up. So, uh, look, I, th I think we've, um, we've probably run out of time. We did want to have a, um, some questions. There weren't that many questions and we dealt with a lot of them in the chat as we went along. Um, if you do have particular questions, what I might suggest is that you send them through to either us or to, uh, any of the presenters, um, if you want to, you know, connect with them, I'm sure they'll be happy to, to share their contact details. Um, and you can ask them kind of specific questions or, you know, follow up um, if you want to, uh, as, as you need. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, I, I think I'll um, uh, wrap things up. Um, uh, ask you again to, to stay in touch with us, to consider becoming a member, to look out for our next webinar, which is on the 30th of October, Urban Agriculture Lab. So starting to take this work uh, further forward and look at, um, uh, you know, the, the next stage of, uh, of, of, of deepening these relationships and, um, and building the case for this action agenda um, that, we've, that we've laid out, this roadmap for transformation. And um, yes, please, uh, you know, please, please stay in touch. Please stay in touch with each other. A huge thank you um, to, to Chris Cornish, to, to Chris uh, Martin, to Janet Willoughby, to, to Lee Tozzi, to Heather Johnston, to Aidan Lang, uh, to Pete Olds. Um, and I'm sure there's, uh, is there someone I've forgotten? Um, please remind me if there's somebody I've forgotten. I don't want to forget anybody. Um, uh, no one's saying anything, so I hope I've remembered everybody. Of course, Kelly, um, Kelly Donati, Chair of Sustain, lecturer at William Anglis, um, Georgia and Ariana, our volunteers. Um, yes, thanks very much. Uh, everyone was there. Thanks very much, uh, Ariana. Um, and yes, please enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your weekend, stay safe, take care of each other. And, uh, and we look forward to staying in touch. This webinar will be available on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. And the report from the pandemic gardening survey will be available in November. Thank you all. Have a fantastic day. Thanks very much. <laughs>